Hi, I'm Dr. Steve Roth at Stanford University School of Medicine. I'm a professor of pediatrics and pediatric cardiology. I fell in love with pediatric cardiology because of the interplay of anatomy, the defects that children have with structural heart disease that they're born with, and how that changes their physiology, how the blood goes round and how the blood is oxygenated, and how that impacts how they can grow uh, and how they can exercise. Those things always fascinated me. My name is Frank Hanley. I'm a professor of cardiothoracic surgery at Stanford Medical School, and I primarily work at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. I'm also the executive director of the Betty Irene Moore Children's Heart Center. At the Betty Irene Moore Children's Heart Center, we are known nationally and internationally for taking on some of the most complex patients. We have individuals who want to take on the most difficult challenges in the field. We're not afraid or we're not reluctant to take on the most complex patients. We've worked for years and decades to develop techniques and advance the field such that we can provide hope and actually quite good outcomes for some of these very complex conditions that others would deem untreatable, inoperable, or hopeless. Congenital heart disease or, or structural heart defects from birth turn out to be the most common birth defect in our U.S. population. Approximately eight of a thousand babies who are born will have some form of structural heart disease. And that means that there's something about the way the heart formed before the baby was born that isn't normal. There are a number of ways that we can identify children who have a heart problem. First, most heart problems in children are structural problems, a, a type of problem called congenital heart disease. So those types of structural problems we can now often see when a baby is still in the womb. So we can use scanning techniques with ultrasound to be able to make a diagnosis before a baby's born in many cases of structural or congenital heart disease. If we're not able to do that, if it isn't detected at that point in time, oftentimes a baby will present within the first days or weeks of life. It may be because when a provider listens with a stethoscope, they hear an abnormal sound which is often referred to as a murmur. Or perhaps a baby who seems to be breathing comfortably doesn't have normal color, perhaps is a little bit blue. We use the term blue when the oxygen level is a little lower than normal. That's fairly easy to detect now with simple screening techniques in the hospital before a baby goes home and is a, is a standard practice in most newborn nurseries. So, either early on before a baby's even born or soon after birth with simple screening techniques, we can detect the majority of heart defects, uh, especially the most significant defects. In some cases, we don't know the exact cause. It may be that something occurred during the time of gestation, during the nine months before a baby's born, perhaps a viral infection or exposure to something that causes the heart to develop in an abnormal way. There are, however, in some cases, abnormalities that occur along the way as a child progresses. These are acquired heart defects, which are much more common in adults than they are in children, but they do occur in children and are caused by a, a number of different types of insults to the heart. There are a few things that a mother, an expectant mother, could do that might reduce the chance of having a baby with a structural heart defect. So making sure that diabetes and, and blood glucose is under good control 
during the time that a baby is developing in a mother. There are a small number of medications that have been associated with the development of structural heart defects or ab abnormal heart function. Um, that information is often available from an obstetrician um, and certainly is, is available from pediatricians and pediatric cardiologists as well. It depends on the specific type of heart defect. There are some types of heart defects that clearly are related to genetic abnormalities that can therefore run in families over generations. It's more likely then that a child would be born after a family history, a positive family history of that particular type of heart defect. Many heart defects though occur in, in an unexpected pattern. That is to say, the family doesn't have a history of congenital heart disease and a baby is born with a structural heart defect. And typically when that happens, while there is a slightly increased chance of a next child, if, if another baby is born to that set of parents, also having congenital heart disease, it's only a few percent higher. The most common types of problems involve mild abnormalities of one of the heart valves or a residual hole between the upper two chambers of the heart, the atria, that's an atrial septal defect, or between the two lower chambers of the heart, the ventricles. It's called a ventricular septal defect. Statistically speaking, when you look at a large population of children, when you see the types of defects they have, many of them are the simpler ones that are easier to treat and occasionally even can resolve on their own over time. There are two fundamentally different techniques. Surgical techniques, which are more time honored and have been in existence now for almost 70 years in our field, and newer techniques that are less invasive uh, that are therefore easier to, uh, to undergo in a sense and are performed with catheters in, instead of with surgery. It's very important to say that even in the types of surgeries we can do or sometimes the catheter interventions we can do that lead to a repair, it's not truly a cure most of the time. That is to say we haven't totally corrected a situation to the point where it's just like normal. It's as good as if there never were that congenital heart defect. So one of the major goals that we have in our program at Stanford and Lucille Packard Children's Hospital is to work over the next generation, the next few decades, towards true cures, or better yet, even towards prevention of these types of defects. We think that there are many advantages to being able to get towards a normal physiology sooner than later. So our strong recommendation for these types of problems is to intervene earlier and to balance the best time for surgery with a longer period of time with more normal physiology whenever it can be achieved. It depends a lot on how complex the problem is and whether or not it's possible to repair the defect as opposed to simply making it better and not getting to a normal physiology. Heart disease can have a big impact on normal growth and development. We are very much aware of that and our programs have built into them the importance of thinking about how best to optimize the potential of every child, whether their problem is a relatively simple one, and we don't expect there to be much disturbance from usual growth and development, or something on the other end of the spectrum that's very dramatic and can have an enormous impact on how a child is able to move forward, to grow and to develop and be a, a playful, happy toddler. One important way to look at a program is if 
a program does a high volume of cases, it usually is an indication that they have a particular expertise where individuals from a very far distance are going beyond, they're looking beyond their local institutions and coming to an institution where there is a, uh, a special or higher level of expertise. Only about 20 centers in the country do more than 200 surgical procedures per year. In our program at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital, uh, in our total program, we do in the range of 900 to 1,000 operations a year, which puts us, in terms of volume of cases, uh, certainly in the top three or four and maybe even higher than that. If we look at all the children and the young adults who come to us for these procedures, the overall survival rate here is over 97.5%. So that's all types of heart disease, from the simpler types to the most complex types. Um, and that's, that's an excellent outcome, a single outcome measure for a program like ours. What is most rewarding to us, maybe even more rewarding than seeing a healthy child leave the hospital who came in with a hopeless condition, is receiving a note or a holiday card or a first grade graduation card or even a high school graduation card uh, from a family with a picture of a healthy looking individual and the gratitude that the family shows for what we did for their child. That is the most rewarding part of what we do day in and day out. And I think it is that commitment to a patient-centered type care transparency, respect for the patient, always recognizing that we're not just doing a procedure, we're working with a family. Uh, these are core um, elements of our program that we all take very, very seriously. And I think this is what is extremely important to families. If you have a child who has congenital heart disease or are looking for more information about how we diagnose and treat children, with pediatric heart disease, I encourage you to visit our website, which is heart.stanfordchildrens.org.